Penetration testers and ethical hackers, I have a few tricks to share with you to add to your toolkit. So credit where credit is due, this one comes from a blog post that I've seen previously on secureyourit.co.uk, just another pen testing site, and this blog is put together by Richard Davey. The contact page on his blog references his handle or alias, rd underscore pen test, and you can find that on Twitter or X. I'll leave the link to this post in the video description, and I will preface, maybe you might consider this old because it was released on November 2nd of 2024, last year, so old for for what you might call it, and maybe folks are familiar with this, but I did want it to bring to your attention. While the title here is Living Off the Land, I think there are some other tricks to this. Previously, he was performing a laptop build review, just trying to see what was possible if any potential employees or new onboarded team members might actually end up being able to break out of what was supposed to be a secure build. Now, he was exploring the Microsoft Software Center that you might be used to, and maybe you've seen in organizations or different businesses, but this post isn't specifically about vulnerabilities while looking at the Microsoft Software Center, it's more of one of the unique binaries or programs that he's found while looking at that that has been a little bit more useful. This is serviceui.exe. Serviceui.exe is a Microsoft signed binary. It's coming from Microsoft. So it's legitimate, it's signed, it's got the code certificate there, and it looks as valid as possible because it's from Microsoft. That, I think, is the nod to living off the land, as we might be accustomed to with lolbass or lolbins, like binaries that are native and installed on your computer, but this might not be. So we could pull this binary in, and you're still using a trusted, legitimate, signed Microsoft program. Anyway, serviceui.exe is included inside of a Microsoft deployment toolkit. So we have a link here, and again, I'll share that in the video description for you to reference as well. So let's go ahead and download this Microsoft deployment kit, and you'll note this actually includes different MSI or Microsoft installer packages. You could choose whatever is pertinent for a 32-bit architecture or 64-bit architecture, x86 or x64 respectively. I'll go for the 64-bit one. And while that is downloading, I do want to show you something else super cool. So for our penetration tester friends, please let me take just a few moments to tell you about the sponsor of today's video. Attack Forge. Overwhelmed with pen test data and reporting? Chaotic workflows slowing down your offensive security testing? If only there were a single source of truth, bringing teams and stakeholders together. That's Attack Forge. With Attack Forge, you can delegate tasks to team members, monitor testing progress, and align your testing coverage for both internal and external compliance mandates. Track testing outcomes, link vulnerabilities to action tests, and collaborate on red team and purple team assessments and let it do the work for you. Leverage centralized libraries for fast and easy registration of vulnerabilities with unlimited custom reports on demand and leveraging your existing templates. Attack Forge Flows automates offensive security workflows, integrating with ticketing, messaging, bug bounty, threat intelligence platforms, and so much more. Using Flows, you can trigger scans, notifications, and custom actions, all to save time and enhance enterprise collaboration. Attack Forge is your central platform for managing penetration tests with real-time reporting, collaboration, and full visibility. It brings all your offensive security data and workflows into one place for faster tests, better reports, and total control. You can get started with Attack Forge with an on-demand and self-service free trial with my link below in the video description jh.live slash attack forge huge thanks to attack forge for sponsoring this video all right now i've got the microsoft deployment toolkit downloaded and available here on my desktop in a windows 11 virtual machine and i want to go ahead and get this cruising i'll click through all the next 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 let this thing install and let me please say that this is the msi package that contains all of this info that includes the service UI.exe binary, but that doesn't mean that you have to bring in or ship this entire MSI and then follow through the installation steps just to get the binary. Once you have this set, maybe even downloaded on a separate computer, a completely different host, then you could go grab the actual executable that is now available in your program files, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, 
in the templates directory under the distribution here, and then the tools that follow suit in either x64 or x86. I'll get x64 and I'll scroll down to find our service UI.exe. This is really all we need. In fact, I could just copy this, go put it on our desktop, and then it doesn't need to be in that entire folder or directory that this came from, from the MSI package. Anyway, I say that just that you know you don't need that full MSI, you just need serviceui.exe. Now, this is one, though, that might very well require some graphical user interface and, like, actual interaction with the desktop environment. Uh, you might have some difficulty scripting this or automating this from a command line procedure method, but let me show you some other tricks that could still let this happen. In that desktop, let me try and run our service UI.exe, and it gives us some of the help information. Execute a program interactively in a target session. It says it must run from the system context. Let's go back to the blog post and read more about this. Now, if you've got this downloaded and you're following along, they note executing service UI.exe gives the following options, just as we saw. A simple test for code execution, we can run service UI and then the full path, they're using the command line or cmd.exe environment variables here. You'll notice the percent signs wrapping around the variable name for the Windows directory. That fills in the absolute path c colon backslash windows backslash notepad.exe. That would launch Notepad. So this, truth be told, is pretty simple and easy, right? I'm in PowerShell right now, so without needing to use the percent signs as you would in cmd.exe or use the dollar sign env colon winder, we can just type out the full thing, c colon backslash windows notepad.exe. Now this errors because it needs a logon session, like a valid interactive graphical user interface and logical session. They had success when they ran this, but that was because they ran it as the local administrator. Now my user account is in the administrator's group, but I did not open up this terminal with administrator privileges, opening up with like control shift enter, let us show you, control shift enter as I open up the terminal and going through the user account control pop-up. If I were to do this very same thing, let me see if that will behave Let's run with our Windows notepad.exe test. That executes and notepad opens up. Now there are a couple of gimmicks and some nuance that I want to talk about because if we were to use a command like query user, we'd be able to see that there is in fact an actual session with session ID one for my user. When we tried to run service UI.exe with our low privilege, that didn't happen, even though there is something that should be there. So this is usually when people in the YouTube comments tend to roll their eyes and say, well, yeah, if you have local admin privileges to be able to run and do whatever, then you're already admin. What more is there? You could do whatever you want. Well, sort of. There is an element of truth to that, and I won't deny it, but we could go even higher, like gating privileges as anti-authority system, or in some cases, trusted installer. And let me uh, ramble and rant for a second because I think it's often overlooked that it is usually easy to get to local admin privileges in the offensive security or pen testing context. Because usually, I mean, even for just your own personal laptop, if you're the only user of this laptop, you're more often than not the local admin and way too often in IT industry, security businesses and companies, maybe individuals that are given their own laptop are again, the local admin there or way too often users have privileges and permissions being the admin when they shouldn't be. Anyway, I think that always has a worthwhile grain of salt to uh, be included in that conversation. So on the basis that we've achieved local administrator privileges, again, we use that as a starting point. Even Eastentire in a recent Threat Intel write-up in a blog post for uh, Nightshade C2, and this is an anecdote, I'm sorry, but they cover how they use this UAC prompt bombing. They repeatedly pop open the UAC prompt over and over and over again until the user clicks yes and allows the malware or payload to run as admin. Anyway, sorry, say we want to gain an interactive system shell. Now, we've covered this in a couple other videos, normally noting, okay, you could do this via the task scheduler or scheduled tasks on Windows, and Richard Davey walks through this operation where you can do this via the graphical user interface, just setting up a new task and then having it run service UI with whatever you want and then it'll execute as system. And he showcases this query user technique as you would to be able to find a specific logon session, but that would get you where you wanna go. So on its own, 
ServiceUI.exe still can act as like a sort of execution cradle. And I think that's a point worth mentioning. If we were to run ServiceUI.exe with Windows Notepad.exe, that will fire and execute. And if I were to go take a look at Process Explorer, that ServiceUI.exe trusted legitimate Microsoft binary is the parent of the child process, of course, right? Oh, and I should be sure to run this as admin. So let's get UAC prompt for Process Explorer. Now let me go hunt for Notepad. Notepad here checks the parent with PID 4304, which is just what it suggests in service UI output. Let me try to run this with like car map. So that way we might have a process that exists. Oh, system 32, my bad. Okay, now that will maintain its execution because there wasn't like some Microsoft app in the way. Now let's get back to process explorer. Here it is. Service UI.exe with carmap.exe as the parent, excuse me, the child. Here it is, service UI.exe, and that is a super teeny weeny, small and tiny, trite trivial thing where it could potentially break some detections, detection rules. Hunting for execution of malicious binary out of the blue, well, now if it's coming from trusted, legitimate, real Microsoft signed binary that is not something you have rules for, eh. Just one thing. Staging that could still mean a really simple proxy execution context so that you don't have a child process out of explorer.exe or wherever, whatever, that's more usually caught and signatured. But anyway, let's get to running this as system using the task scheduler or a scheduled task. Now again, if you are able to do this via the graphical user interface, this is the worthwhile showcase to see how that's done, but you might more interestingly want to run this as an automated thing, as commands or scripts or things that you can stage. Obviously we'll run this as system while I change the user and group with that button click there, check the name for system and then run with highest privileges, the actions will want to create a new startup of a program from our desktop and the service UI binary. You could put that wherever. And the arguments that we would want to run, let's do a uh, car map again, just so we can see that child parent process chain. Carmap.exe, click okay, okay. Now that that's created, let me get to our library. Let's go go ahead and manually run or trigger our system CMD. And with that, you should now see car map executed while it was hidden and tucked away from me. But getting back to Process Explorer, that should now be running as system. Can I get to car map? Yeah, here it is. Service UI.exe, car map.exe. Taking a look at the properties and I should have ran this as admin. I keep forgetting. <laughs> All right, now you can see of course, the properties here. The user executing this is NT Authority System and CarMap Child Process consequently is NT Authority System. You could of course run cmd.exe to get an interactive shell. You could run your payload, you could get a reverse shell, you could drop whatever you want and that will still have that NT Authority System level permissions. But that I know is the graphical user interface method that might not be as slick and as sexy as we want. Now, a previous video of mine walked through going even higher than NT Authority System and elevating to Trusted Installer. Now, that had bits and pieces of the manual steps that you might walk through. But I just recently received an email from someone who watched that video and then took things a little bit further to try and automate or streamline that. Now, I did ask permission if I could share their work, and they said yes, they did want it to be credited as Matthew, so thank you, Matthew. And he says, hey, I watched your video on becoming trusted installer, and I took a closer look at the source behind NT Object Manager. I ended up creating a wrapper for the trusted installer command prompt that not only spawns the command prompt process, but also enables all privileges. Like when you run who am I slash priv and you see all the like SE impersonate, SE debug, SE all the different security tokens or privileges you might have within Windows. He did something interesting. He says for safety is password protected on a separate shell to prevent any remote code execution at the trusted installer level. Here's how I did it. I took the NT object manager dot DLL, compressed it and then converted its contents to base 64. Then I reversed the process at runtime, loading the DLL into memory so I can use the raw function calls from NT object manager. He did this all in PowerShell and then compiled it into an executable with PS to EXE and you could do the very same, but he included a triage report for the dot EXE wrapper and then a zip archive for the source code. I'll include those links in the video description. I'll credit to Matthew. But this is the PowerShell source code. 
So simple, trusted cmd.ps1, where there are command line arguments to bypass or force. Looks like it sets the title of the window to trusted cmd password lock, and he has a couple registry keys reference and even like a max number of attempts or lockout for the password protection. Then he includes a big long list of all the different SE privileges, or all, again, all the capability that this higher elevated command prompt in session should have. A lot of this is some boilerplate to be able to test if it is being used safely with the uh, registry key that's been used to track all the operations in runtime to use a password protection on this, which are just kind of nicety bells and whistles thing. If you wanted to turn this into an even more automated streamline tooling, you could ignore those, cut those out. But if I turn word wrap off, then you can see, or on whichever one of those. Obviously, this is the giant base64 dump of ntobjectmanager.dll. I think this is actually very clever. Uh, we did this exact same thing when we were working with the print nightmare exploit years ago. I think that's like 2021, I don't even remember. But we crammed a whole DLL inside of a PowerShell script so that it could then be uh, unraveled and loaded at runtime. Some commented code here that we could probably, again, cut out if we wanted to, but then he brings in some .NET or C Sharp capability to add in a bunch of the different variables and boilerplate that's necessary to be able to spawn a process. Then it asks for a password, which we could skip over if we were to use that force and bypass command line switch. And then he starts to work through the things that were pertinent in that trusted installer video that will give you even higher privileges than NT authority system. And truthfully, that's it. PowerShell script that just gives you all that power. Once you have local admin, you can jump up to system and jump up to trusted installer. So let's play with it. Let's get back into our Windows 11 virtual machine. I'll open up the Windows PowerShell ISE editor just so I could slap in all of this code. And let's save this again on our desktop as that trusted cmd.ps1 PowerShell script. Now, let's try this in both cases. Let's open up a terminal and have that command line access even as a low privilege user. I doubt this will work, but it's worth trying. Can I run our trusted cmd.ps1 and I'll use the force and bypass Pass switches. Now this shouldn't work. Yeah, pretty bloody lot of different PowerShell errors. Obviously uh, can't handle HKLM because you need the permissions to be able to do that. Run as admin if you're modifying the registry. And I don't think it'd even start or play with the trusted installer service because it doesn't have those permissions. So it was fun, but again, want to draw that point, want to make sure that's clear. Knowing that you need the administrator privileges is just part of the operations. Run trusted CMD, force and bypass, and that should pop open a shell for us. Obviously, this is running as NT authority system, but we are in, if I go take a look at the groups, the trusted installer group. And if I were to take a look at my privileges, we have all of the ones that were included in that sweet little streamlined script. So full control, that's pretty cool. You might have noticed while we were playing with that though, that that did start a new console window. So that might get in the way if you're trying to operate on like, oh, a command and control thing, Metasploit, Sliver, Cobalt Strike, whatever. You don't have to have this run cmd.exe. You could make it run service UI.exe or anything else that you wanted to, or a payload that could get another connection, make another callback, anything there. So you don't require or need or have the necessity of that interactive graphical user interface GUI display. I honestly think this is pretty slick though. Like being able to take like from PowerShell code, just copy paste, slap it in there, and then you own the whole thing. That's kind of neat. Hey, thanks so much for watching everybody. Please do all those YouTube algorithm things like comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Please do give some love to our sponsors. There's a link in the video description. TacForge is a new member of the family. And I really appreciate all their support and yours. See you in the next video.